Okay, we're recording. Welcome everybody. Um, I'm Alan Sherman, director of the UMBC Cyber Defense Lab. Uh, today we are having a guest speaker, Ryan Warns, um, to talk about um, his work on incident response systems. Uh, Ryan graduated from uh, UMBC in CS in 2013, and he started a new company um, called uh, Outcome Security, and he's going to be telling us about his work uh, in that company and on the technology of um, the Kaleidoscope platform, which provides um, effective uh, incident response workflows. Um, this is the penultimate uh, CDL talk of the fall in on December 1st. Uh, Anis Goloshevsky will speak about his work on automatic binding and protocol analysis, and then we'll resume our, our talks in the spring. So thank you very much, Ryan. We're excited to hear what you have to say. Yeah, thanks guys. Appreciate the invite. Um, let me go ahead and share this and then we can get started. Can you guys see that? Yes, no, all right, cool, 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 cool. Um, yeah, so Dr. Sherman kind of said it already. My name's Ryan. Uh, I am currently a founder at a startup called Outcome Security, where we're building a security operations platform that we call Kaleidoscope. A um, little bit about uh, kind of background on my side. Um, I graduated UMBC. I had a comp side degree. Um, I was also a Gen 1 cyber dog. So if you're familiar with kind of the cyber defense team that Dr. Nicholas helps kind of coordinate. Uh, we helped found it. I don't know if we were very good back then, but, you know, we sort of laid the foundation, I guess. Um, and then early on in my career, I was primarily focused on the kind of offensive security side of the house. So we're all in Maryland and we all know the kinds of places that are around the corner in Maryland. And so I worked at um, a DOD contractor and primarily I was on the kind of systems engineering side. I was a rootkit guy, so very like low level sort of stuff. And then it's kind of mixed and mashed with lots of reverse engineering, lots of vulnerability research and things kind of of that flavor. And so I did that for a little while and then I jumped over to FireEye Mandiant, who if you're not familiar, Mandiant's kind of the premier incident response firm kind of commercially out there and uh, they brought me over to do some reverse engineering level kind of like skills to help them uh, across different like business units and they primarily were focused on the kind of defensive side of the house but also kind of mix and mash with sort of some red teaming type work there and so there was kind of a long windy path on that piece of it but um i was there during the solar winds breach so if you guys have all read about that or heard that you know i helped support that sort of stuff and throughout you know my six or seven years over there i've done everything from red teaming to incident response to reverse engineering malware analysis i've kind of put my hands in a lot of different cookie jars and so Myself and my co-founder, who has a similar sort of like winding background, basically said, you know, we've worked in the government space for a long time, and then we've worked in the commercial space for a long time, and we kind of were starting to see the same sort of problems over and over, and that's what ultimately led to us making our own company and our own product, and so I'll tell you a little bit about, you know, how the product works and what we're doing um, as the kind of presentation goes on, but what I would say to kind of like tether the talk to is a lot of the kind of inspiration for that is having seen all these different like cybersecurity use cases and what that looks like if you're the guy in the trenches looking at, you know, you have malware samples flying across your desk every day or you have alerts you have to triage from a firewall or something like that. And so we took all of that and I'm going to use this kind of talk to walk you through some of the problems that are pretty common across the industry in incident response in particular. And then I'll give you guys a little bit of flavor around if you were to go and get a job in the security space right now, you know, what are we seeing from products that are out there, what they're supposed to do and kind of what that like environment looks like, because I think that's one of the things that, you know, it's always good to kind of keep in mind, uh, you know, when I was in school, it was a lot of, I really liked like this part and it was a low level stuff and maybe like the puzzle solving aspect, but, as soon as you start to get out there and you start to see what kind of tools are available for any kind of security team at an organization, you know, things can kind of go off the rails pretty fast. So this agenda, I'll keep it pretty loose. So, I mean, feel free to ask questions and jump in and 
you know, whatever, whatever thoughts you have, you know, I'll try to address as I kind of go along. But um, generally how I'm going to flow this is we're going to start kind of laser focused on what we're really talking about when we say incident response, because it can mean sort of different things to different people. And then I'm going to broaden out a little bit to connect that to some of the stuff I was saying on the last slide, which is how do I take my data plus the tools that are out there plus like commercial data fees and kind of marry that all together? Like what does that provide me as an analyst? And then once we have an understanding of that, we'll sort of refocus back into the IR space and we'll talk about, okay, how do I take all of this sort of disconnected spaghetti web of code and data and things like that and use it to create what we're calling kind of incident response workflows. So just a quick level set, right? What is incident response? Um, I think a lot of people, when they hear that, they think of what we would call DFER, which is digital forensics and incident response. And that's like, oh, I need to take this hard drive out and I need to take a look at the file system or I'm gonna go reverse engineer this binary and figure out you know, what's all the malicious stuff that's in this back door, that, that sort of level. And that is a part of it, but for most organizations, most teams, most companies, you don't really go that deep unless you really have to. And when you do have to, you tend to kind of hire specialized like companies. So that's what Mandiant did, right? Like something would go wrong and you would get hacked and you would maybe do some initial sort of like triage, kind of figure out what was going on. And then eventually it would go, oh no, like we're really in trouble. And so you would call these guys in and they would sort of jump out of their SWAT helicopters and start ripping all your systems apart and kind of figure out what was going wrong, right? Um, but for us, I'm gonna broaden the scope a little bit to say that Incident response is really how do you handle anything that's potentially going wrong? So, you know, an incident could be I get an alert in my firewall. An incident could be my boss yells at me and says, hey, I saw something on Twitter and we need to go like investigate it. Um, in kind of modern organizations and modern systems, there's lots of different tools that spit out lots of different kinds of alerts. And so when we're talking about incident response, it's really, I have an alert that something said it's bad. I need to figure out, is it actually bad? Is it a false positive? And if it is legitimately something we should be concerned about, how do I go about like investigating that and remediating it and figuring out whether it was like a, some script kitty, some teenager in his basement in the UK, or whether it's like a, you know, real deal attack that we need to respond to. And so I'm going to kind of focus on the first four steps in this process that I have laid out here at the bottom, but just to help orient and kind of get some terminology flowing. Um, this is a pretty good framework for how you can at least conceptually think about what like an instant response process is supposed to look like. So generally speaking, detection is what it sounds like. Something happened, it's an anomaly, maybe it's something bad. And so you push it to an analyst or you push it to a tool and you say, hey, I don't know what this is, go look at it. And then the response part covers taking that alert and deciding whether or not it's something serious or a false positive and then kind of adding structure on top of it to say you know if you guys have worked in software engineering shops or whatever maybe it's like a jira ticket or something like that that says hey i'm looking at this thing you know i'll let you know how it goes so that that kind of like something's bad and i need to go figure it out like putting some kind of like process on top of that and then steps three and four are kind of your i've done the legwork to figure out if something's bad um, and so here's how we resolve it. And so mitigation is again, what it sounds like. If it's, you know, they got in through an exploit, we need to patch something. If it's, they got in through user credentials, we need to roll those over. It's how do you kind of fix the bad thing? And then reporting is your almost like retrospective on, all right, here's everything we did. Here's how we know it's bad. Here's what we did to fix it. And then here's what we can kind of recommend in the future to sort of get better over time, right? And I won't talk too much about the kind of recovery and the lessons learned part, but what I will say is that the reason that we talk about instant response in these sort of like structured, you know, stepwise like pieces is because ultimately, whether you're like a small team or a big team, um, you want to get better, right? Like if I get hacked and then I fix a bunch of stuff and then I get targeted six months in the future, I want to know, you know, am I going to do a better job cleaning up? you know, from, you know, when I got breached the first time. And so I want to try to 
look at this as sort of like a process thing. And then what we're going to do is basically break down each of these pieces and see what it looks like to kind of you sitting at a keyboard with a bunch of bad stuff flying around. What do we do about it? And so to do this, I'm going to spend a lot of this talk using phishing as a kind of example attack. Um, and there's a couple of reasons for that. And one of them is we can keep things relatively kind of simple with what the analytical processes look like. But then also, I think it's a good sort of perspective for people that are listening to this talk, because if you had told me when I was sitting where you were, that one day I'd be sitting here, you know, 10 years later, still talking about how like fishing is still all over the place, I would have said, well, there's no way, like, I don't, I don't believe you. Like, it seems like such a really simple problem on the surface, because it's like, I get an email, for those of you who don't know, right, phishing attacks tend to be, we would call them social engineering. It's, I send you a fake email or a fake message or something to basically, you know, masquerade as, hey, I'm your insurance company and we need you to sign this document. And then you click a link and then that leads to kind of like follow on attacks where maybe they steal your credentials or maybe they install malware or something like that. And so phishing as an attack vector coming from that sort of attacker perspective is still super popular because it's basically because it's really easy. Like one of the things that you'll figure out pretty quickly if you take, you know, professional cybersecurity jobs is it's not kind of linear in terms of sophistication. So it's not like if you're at an organization and you're defending against cyber threats, it's not going to be like 50% the kid in his mom's basement and then 50% like North Korea. It's going to be like 95% the kid in his basement and then like 4% somebody that knows a little bit about what they're doing. And then the kind of the APT groups or the nation states, that's sort of like the real, real tip of the spear. Um, and so for most attackers, when we're talking about how do I start attacking an organization, how do I get in there? Um, phishing is really easy. You know, anybody can write an email and really the sort of like payload piece of it, or how do you infect them? That's also from like an engineering perspective, a lot easier for them to write than something like an exploit. And so when you put those two things together, um, what you get is I have a bunch of attackers that are finding more and more ways to launch more and more kinds of attacks. It's very easy for them to write this as like an initial infection mechanism. And then that means I have a lot of phishing attacks. And so in terms of like, why do we care? Uh, you know, you can see the stats on the slide here. It's still super effective. It still happens. And, you know, phrase another way, if I send out um, 700 million phishing emails, like eventually somebody will click it. And that's just the way it goes, right? And so I want to use phishing to kind of break down like, all right, I'm a cyber guy and I'm trying to do some of these incident response type processes. You know, where do we start? How do we start to think about these problems? And then we'll, what we'll do is we'll use this as a kind of example to talk about like a larger framework and how we start to handle some of what we're calling workflows. And so as a place to start, here is a real phishing email that I got two days ago. You know, fun fact, if you ever want to kind of see what's out there from a phishing perspective, um, just start a company and you'll you'll get these, you'll get inundated, you'll get flood. We get these all the time. And so if I am, let's, you know, put our sort of cosplay or whatever hats on and pretend for a second we're sitting somewhere. If I'm an analyst and I am on a security team at maybe a university and somebody says, hey, I just got this email message and I think it's you know, it could be bad, it could be a fish, you know, can you go look at it? What are the things that like we would look for as, you know, cybersecurity kind of experts, right? And this might be straightforward, maybe it's not, but just a couple things to call out. So this one, I, you know, have an advantage because I own the company. So I know we don't have a call support system, right? So kind of a suspicious title. And then when we start to look at some of the other pieces of the email, it's like, okay, maybe I don't recognize this domain. And then they have this attachment that they're saying is a voicemail. But then if you look at the extension, it's a HTML file. So it's kind of masquerading as something else. So that means if I click it, it's probably going to take me to like a malicious web page or something like that. That's not going to not going to be what they say it is. Right. And then I don't know what this is. This is probably like they had to do something to get past filtering to have kind of email content. And so if I'm sitting there and I, you know, put my thinking cap on, we can come to like a really quick sort of 
litmus test of like, yeah, this email doesn't look right. Like it's, you know, and that's before you even talk about like outcome security is spelled wrong and, you know, things like that. So from a, you know, five second, 10 second, 20 second kind of analysis process, I can say like, all right, this is bad. And so, you know, we can block it or quarantine it or whatever. But what this tells us is it's going to introduce the first of the kind of problems that I'm going to be talking about for this presentation, which is basically, if you think about it, I didn't use a lot of technical words when we just walked through like this example, right? Like I said, the email kind of looks weird and I don't recognize the domain and, you know, maybe there's something with like the attachment, like having a different extension, but none of that's really like a process. A lot of that is you've all seen a lot of emails. I've seen a lot of emails. We all kind of know how emails are supposed to look. And so what this means is another way I would phrase this is that a lot of cybersecurity problems in general, but especially in the incident response space are, you know, they're patterns. They're, oh, this is like bad because of like intuition, because I have seen things over and over and over. And so um, when, you know, we're looking at this and we're looking at like, what is an incident response like workflow supposed to be constructed of? We got to figure out like what our building blocks are. And if I'm looking at an email like this and I just say it's weird, that doesn't really give me something to sort of improve on over time, to iterate on over time, to get better on over time. And so the first problem, I'm going to wrap all this up and I'm just going to say cybersecurity analysis is really ad hoc and you'll have to take my word on it. This could be a whole different presentation, but Again, I said phishing is representative of kind of the larger space. This is true for every cybersecurity problem you will ever run into. And there's a lot of reasons for that that I won't get into, but uh, up to and including when I was teaching, you know, the big boys how to reverse engineer malware and things like that, it boils down to something like this, where it's like, the domain knowledge is a little different. You know, maybe you need to know what like certain pieces of code do and things like that. But at the end of the day, you're doing some kind of like pattern recognition in your brain and you're saying, that's how I know it's bad. So that happens a lot and it happens kind of regardless of the incident. So the next step is like, okay, can I assign some sort of structure to this phishing example and start to kind of build a foundation that we can use to talk about the workflow. And so if we map, the problem I just showed you to the framework that I showed you a couple slides ago, then we can start to talk about this more as a process and less as like an individual problem. And so if you remember the kind of steps, it was detection and response into mitigation into kind of like reporting and remediation and all that stuff. And so with a phishing email, um, something happens, right? And sometimes just, uh, you know, organizations have like an email protection system that'll run like signatures and things like that and put it up on a dashboard somewhere that says, we got this email and it's probably bad, but sometimes it might just be, you know, you click the button in your inbox that says, I don't know what this email is, report it as spam. And then it goes to your security team kind of behind, behind the scenes, right? And so then when we're going through the next step, which is that response process, that is, you know, we make a case and we say, hey, this email came across my desk, I'll make a ticket in our Jira queue or, or Git or whatever you guys use. And then I'll go ahead and I'll look at the email and I'll decide if it's actually malicious or not. And so to actually do that analysis, you kind of do what we just showed you on the last slide, which is you kind of look at the different pieces of the email and then you do sort of like a, a vibe check to see like, is this, is this legitimate content or not? Or are they trying to kind of trick me into doing something else? And then at the end of that, you know, now we have to mitigate and then, you know, for phishing, the good news is that's pretty simple. It's kind of a ping the person, say, hey, this wasn't legitimate. I hope you didn't click the link. If you did click the link, go reset your passwords, that sort of thing. And or, you know, you quarantine the email message. And maybe if you're really going, you know, to the level that you're supposed to, you would go and see, I think it was PCP Express or something was the sender. Like, have we seen other email messages from that? sender or from that domain so that we can go and see was this kind of like a one-off attack or was this something that's been kind of targeting us as a, as a whole right and then i'm going to bundle all of this up into the rest of the process i should say i'll bundle all that up into reporting and remediation and recovery which is basically hey i looked at this email i need to write kind of document why i think it's malicious why we blocked it and ideally you know i want to show i want to show my work in that report right because this example is very simple right but one you know i'm sure you guys have seen this on like group projects and stuff like that not everybody is as smart as everybody else and so that kind of like process of like 
not just what I did, but how I did it and why I did it. That's how you build a real workflow, a real foundation. And that's really how you get better kind of over time. So that was sort of our first Fisher Price phishing example. And I won't go through this one in the same amount of depth, but I will show you a slightly more complicated example because in the first one, that's kind of like, if you look up what phishing is and you just write an email, that's what you get, right? But nowadays there's stuff that's a little more sophisticated, a little harder to kind of like map out directly. So this is another phishing email that we got. And there's a couple things here that's a little different from the previous one, right? There's no attachments. So I can't just look at a .html file that they're saying is a .wav file and be like, oh, okay, that's the bad part. So there's no attachments. The images and the email body, you can trust me on this, but like this is when you have DocuSign, which is like a virtual, you know, PDF signer kind of utility. Um, these are the real images that they send you. Like this looks legit. And if you search that image, like it is legit. And then, you know, the sender is like not so weird. Like it's a little weird, right? But like that could be real. And then really this is a problem compared to the previous example because the malicious stuff is not in the email anymore. The malicious stuff is now somewhere else because you click this link or the image or you scan this QR code and it's gonna take you to like an external resource. And that's probably where they put all the bad stuff. And so we don't have to go through kind of all how you would like pick apart each of these pieces. But what I do wanna say is that what this tells us is that even for very simple kind of examples like these phishing use cases, not all incidents are equal and not all analysis that you need to do for these incidents are equal. And so what this means is if we take our process previously and we think about it more as a framework and more as sort of like general steps, then what we'll find is as teams get bigger and more sophisticated and they have better tools and they have better people, then each of these things, there's kind of increasing complexities and increasing levels of like detail that you can go into for each part of this. So like, I'm not gonna read you this whole table. You know, you guys can, I'll send you the deck after or something, you can look at it, but like just as an example in this sort of response segment, okay, we wanna do tickets, right? That's like, we already talked about that. That's a very easy thing, like email, bad, make a ticket, go do the work, right? When we say case management, we'll talk about that in a little bit, but that's a, how do I track all my tickets to say, here's all the emails that we looked at and then use that to kind of get some metrics about how we're doing over time. And then when I'm doing the actual analysis as part of the response process, um, we want to do something a little more detailed than what I did, which is like, this looks weird and that looks weird. And, and so it's bad. Right. And there's a lot of things you can do going all the way up to, I could have taken that HTML file off of the email and opened it up in a safe way and done some reverse engineering to kind of figure out what that payload looks like. And so you can apply this sort of like ascending scale of complexity with what you can and can't do to each of these steps. And really when you talk about, you know, you hear people talk about building, you know, security programs, or maybe you guys will go build them soon one day. Um, this is kind of what you're talking about. It's, I generally know what we're supposed to be doing, which is like figure out if good thing is bad and then kind of justify why a thing is bad. And then we have these different levers that we can pull that might be tools, or they might be hiring people, or they might be some internal R and D or something to make different parts of that process easier. So to kind of summarize that part a little bit, I said I was using phishing as an example in the beginning because it's a good representative problem and it's a nice, easy to kind of understand entry point of what most incident response kind of looks like, whether you're talking about sophisticated attacks or whatever, because even up to and including like the big guys, you know, APTs are how we kind of generally classify malicious activity coming from like nation states like Russia or China or whoever, um, they still use phishing. So it's not like the technique is totally dead in the water or anything. But, you know, we walked through a couple examples and I kind of gave you a lot of the ropes about like, here's how you would generally like look at this email. And none of it was like too crazy. Cause even if you look a little deeper technically, you know, that second email, it's like, well, maybe I go to the malicious web page and I take a screenshot and I say, oh, it looks like it's pretending to be, you know, umbc.edu. So we still know it's bad, right? But where things in reality start to get really complicated is I showed you that graphic up up top that says like, well, phishing still works, you know, 36% of breaches or whatever it said is still originated from a phishing email that somebody clicks into, right? 
And so once that happens, and again, as a cybersecurity person, you should just assume that it's going to happen. Once that happens, that's where things really start to kind of scale and, and get really complicated because once you click a phishing payload, who knows what it does, right? Like that was like an HTML file in my example, but like that could be anything. It could be a binary, it could be a PDF, it could be whatever. And so if I send it to, you know, whatever, pick a department, HR or a teacher somewhere that doesn't work in computer science, like somebody that's not, you know, technical enough to to take a real close look at the email content coming across and they click it. Well, now what happens? You know, maybe the adversary drops a keylogger or some kind of backdoor onto your system, or maybe it is like a really complicated like thing and it is like an exploit. And so now you have a problem in your browser somewhere instead of like somewhere running on your desktop, or maybe they use it as like sort of an initial step to say, I'm going to go hack Ryan Warns. And then once I have his credentials, I'm going to start sending emails as him to other people inside of the organization because they'll be more likely to click my next phishing email if it looks like it's coming from somebody trusted. And so what this means is once you get past like that first step, now, you know, I need to check like user logins. I need to check what files are being downloaded. I need to check, are they sending weird emails? I need to check all of this stuff. And so when I need to check all of this stuff, all that stuff lives in different places. It could be log files. It could be, you know, an internal like audit trail. It could be event logs on like your laptop or something. And so this is really problem number two, which is if you can get a problem and you can contain it, then everything's kind of easy. But once things start to sort of spiral out of control, the evidence that you need for this IR process is all over the place. There's a million tools flying around, you know, who knows how many, well, I'm sure, you know, somebody knows how many like laptops and things like that are kind of connected to UMBC's network. So like you immediately had this big problem of like, here's all this stuff that I need to kind of coordinate with to figure out. Now it's not a potential phishing attack. It's a real phishing attack. And how deep does it go? And how many people got uh, infected by this like particular message or something? And so when you talk about how, okay, well, how do we do that? I just kind of said it on the last slide as, well, there's a bunch of stuff flying around. So what is that stuff? And that's where I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what cyber defense tools in the commercial space really look like, because a lot of this, you know, the email is kind of like an easy case, but once you start to talk about, well, now I have logs from a bunch of different systems that I need to cross-reference, or I have a binary and I need to know, is it running on my system? And I need to know if we know it's malicious and things like that. That starts to get into like a really complicated, various complicated like problem spaces, right? And so, what this means is for most organizations, big or small, you're gonna have some amount of third party tools, data feeds and things like that available to your organization to help with this incident response process, right? And so some of these will just be, they provide data. You know, it'll be, here's a list of all the domains we've seen over the past six months that are sending out phishing emails. And so you can maybe use that data stream when you get an email to query and say like, do we know this is bad? Some of these tools are gonna help with looking into um, different like signatures and things like that, that you can run over that because it's a very different skill set and a different sort of specialization to say, I need to look at an attachment to see if I know this is a virus versus I need to look at a domain and see if I know it's serving up bad content. And so there's kind of no one size fits all. There's no silver bullet for what tools you are and aren't going to have. And so I'm going to kind of break them down into really broad categories for you to just kind of talk through a couple of these concepts. But I would be remiss if I didn't mention that, you know, these next this next part is all squishy because there's a lot of sort of business reasons where, you know, you're incentivized to basically say, well, my product does everything. So you don't need this and that and this and that. You just get my thing and then you get four things for one, basically. So I'm going to give you a quick kind of whirlwind and then we'll see a little bit about how you can use these to, like I said, connect back to that incident response kind of workflow and framework that we've been talking about so far. So the first kind of product category that I'm going to talk about is probably the ones that you have seen before or more likely to have seen before, which is what we call 
endpoint detection and response or EDRs. And this is really the evolution of what used to be called like antivirus products. And there's kind of, there's technical reasons for this and there's business reasons for this, but basically we don't say AV anymore, we say EDR. And it does more or less the same stuff. It's focused on, I am pulling telemetry off of machines to figure out, is there something that looks malicious? I am running signatures over binaries to see if it's known malware, things like that. Um, NDR is kind of a subset of that where it's really focused on the network traffic pieces of it. So network logs, you can run the same kind of signatures over like HTTP traffic or other kinds of like network traffic to say, hey, this signature matches like a known known malicious actor or whatever. And then in the industry nowadays, you'll hear a lot about XDRs. And that is really like, can I take all these things and combine them into one extended unified kind of detection framework? And so primarily what this is doing for a security team is I have some weird artifacts. So in our example, it might be that .htm file that they were pretending was a WAV. And I'm gonna upload it. You know, a lot of these guys have like sandboxes or something like that built into these tools. And it's gonna say, hey, I know it's bad because it's doing X, Y, Z. And, you know, it belongs to like this group of viruses and, and things like that. So it's primarily on the kind of detection half of that workflow to basically say, you know, Something hits my laptop, how do I know if it's good or bad? Then the next category I'm gonna talk about is uh, SEAMS or security information and event management. And I said it a little bit when I talked about how things start to get really complex really fast, which is that once you know an attacker is like in an organization, uh, you know, who knows? Who knows where they are or how deep they are or whatever. And so, Something that's happened, if you guys have seen, you know, what like cloud computing looks like nowadays, or you've seen stuff like Kubernetes or Docker or all these other things, uh, I'm going to leave all the technical stuff to the side and just say, it's really easy for organizations to spin up more stuff. And that's good for the business because I can put more stuff in my sort of organization more easily. I can add more products, I can have more services, I can have more stuff and that's good because it means I can do more for my customers. So that's all good for business. It's not good for security, right? Because now I have a million things flying around. And so like, if I need to have a piece that says like, I need to figure out somebody clicked this phishing email and then the bad guy went somewhere and logged in and did something. Now I have to check all these different places to say like, well, you know, was he in the email system? Was he in our web server? Was he in, you know, where did he go and what is he doing? And so that's really what SIEM products are meant to combat, which is you have a bunch of logs from a bunch of different systems. You put them in a centralized place and you do what's called like an indexing operation to make them searchable. And so then now if I am, again, putting my hat on, I'm my incident response guy, I need to go and see, um, I can go and look and I can do a search query and it'll pull logs from all these different things. And so I can use that to start to try to hunt for that needle in a haystack of basically, I kind of know what I'm looking for because it came from this payload or this email or something. And so I need to figure out what other logs it pops into because then that will tell me what other systems might be infected by, you know, this particular attack chain. And generally speaking, seems stop at just the searching part. So we're past detection, right? Something bad happened and now I'm looking at my seam and I'm basically trying to determine the extent of a breach. Um, and so generally speaking, that's where they all kind of stay focused, but some of them will do like ticketing or alerts and stuff like stuff like that. This is kind of what I was saying earlier about products categories are kind of squishy. You know, some seams will say you can make a ticket and then map all your queries to the ticket and kind of go from there, right? But for our purposes, seems do searching. That's that's really what they're built for. That's really what they're good for. So then the next part or the next category is called SOAR platforms, which are security orchestration, automation, and response. And really what this is, is the first sort of step into what we would call a kind of workflow for these incident response problems. Um, what they are is a kind of automation layer that lets you apply sort of like policies and procedures to how you're handling pieces of data. So like a common SOAR function might be, 
when I get a phishing email, send it to a sandbox. And if it comes back and says it's malicious, open a ticket. So those kinds of like kind of codified steps of like, I want to be able to kind of track across all these systems, how stuff is happening and how we're using them. That's where kind of sores come from. And this is kind of all inspired by the same rationale where, you know, I'm sure you guys have heard it nowadays, everybody's very excited about AI and ML and, and all that sort of stuff as it applies to security. And it all kind of comes from the same perspective of like, um, I think we saw it's like 700 million phishing sites and stuff like that across 2022. And so if you're a security team, and by the way, you know, most security teams are like small and I might even argue most of them are understaffed. So now you have like two people and they have to handle 5 million email messages a day. Like you need something to sort of like fix that asymmetry. Right. And so that's where a lot of these like automation requirements tend to come from. And so that's really where SOARs are focused is, can I take that detection, mitigation, response, like that kind of flow that I showed you earlier, and can I add a layer to start to connect some of those pieces? And, you know, we're a product company, we would argue this isn't really in depth enough, but it's important that like, that's where it kind of comes from. And that's where they're trying to focus their attention. Then the next kind of tool set that you have kind of at your fingertips is what's called a threat intelligence platform or a tip. Um, broadly speaking, tips are data providers that say whether or not things are bad. So there's a lot of different ways to do that, a lot of different ways to make that determination. But at the end of it all, what they're doing is saying, here's a list of IOCs. So IOCs are indicators of compromise. That's things like, <laughs> domains, IPs, file hashes, things like that, where they've seen other malicious actors use that piece of data to do a malicious action. And what tips do is they kind of aggregate all of that and they give it to an organization. And so they say, when you see an email and that email set has a hash or something, you can take the hash and you can look it up in our big database of all the bad stuff and we'll tell you whether or not it's bad. And there's some more that they do, um, uh, that's like a bigger picture thing, which is they try to cluster kind of attribution for particular attacks. So like if you're talking about the Chinese uh, cyber attackers, like they have a particular set of tools and techniques and ways that they like to do their attacks. And so when you see them in the future, you can basically take that kind of like attacker pattern and say like, oh, you know, because of X, Y, Z, maybe this is North Korea or China or whoever. And so they try to do some of that clustering there and basically give you context. So you don't just have like a, a domain or an IP or something. So they try to give you some insight into like what's actually going on. Um, I am is pretty short. We'll go, we'll just kind of blow past it, right? I am is your identity and access management. So this is who are your users? Who are they logged in as? What do they have access to? that sort of stuff. And so particularly for like phishing attacks or things where you stay, stay uh, user credentials are stolen. This is where I am tends to come into play as sort of a, Hey, he's logging in from a weird location that it usually doesn't log into those sorts of questions get covered by IAM platforms. And then the last one's probably the simplest, right? Case management. So, you know, tickets, something bad happened, what's our project look like? You know, security guys, it's, if you've worked as a developer, you probably have seen like Jira queues where they have projects and you subdivide them into like sub tickets and things like that. Similar organization for security teams, right? Um, but in its simplest form, right? We're just trying to track how I triage alerts, what alerts I triage and things like that. And case management is not really cyber specific, like lots of organizations and teams and things like that have cases, but some general rules that we think are good practices for case management, which not every organization does, but they could do one day maybe, is generally if you have an alert that you turn into a ticket, you wanna grab as much context upfront as you can. So, you know, where did the alert come from? Why did the system think it was bad? Is there other sort of like metadata that might help an investigator that's looking at that, figure out what's going on? Um, generally speaking, a ticket should resolve as like, this is benign or it's a false positive and we don't need to worry about it. Um, or it should resolve to something actionable, right? Um, even at like the simplest case, I looked at this email, this is bad, we should take this domain and block it 
on the on the edge on the perimeter right um and then as part of that they should justify like why that happened you know again a lot more in a lot more detail than what i did on our first phishing email but they should say you know we looked at this and this domain was bad because of this and we looked at the hash of the attachment and that showed up in this tip or something or we looked at the email content and it's like pretending to be a different site that doesn't match the domain like that kind of stuff basically your sort of show your work component should also be in the ticket so that's our breadth right we've kind of covered we started with ir and then we went to where does ir get kind of complicated and we zoomed out a little bit and then we zoomed out a little bit and then i've now outlaid sort of all of the tools that are at your disposal when you run into these incidents and how you start to handle them and so the question now is well where does the need for the workflow to come from because i already have all these tools and i kind of have an idea that if i want to external consult or if i want to consult like an external source to help understand an alert i have these things like tips and data feeds and stuff like that and if i want to figure out if it's internal to my organization i have things like seams or logs or whatever and then for mitigation i have you know signatures and block lists and all that stuff so where does the need for like an incident response kind of workflow really come from and the problem is basically uh what i described was i have an event somebody does something bad and it really spirals out into all these different things and i have whatever 50 services 50 servers 500 users whatever and then i have all of these tools that are taking different parts of that problem and saying well we'll fix that part we'll fix this part we'll fix the data part we'll fix the asset part we'll let you see visibility or net whatever it is and so these are all separate tools that solve separate parts of that process that we were talking about because it's not going to be the case where if it's not clear from how i've explained all these categories right if i have a tip that might not help me mitigate an attack. If I have a seam, that might not help me detect an attack. If I have a case management, that might not help me do anything. And I just use it to sort of like track the overall effort, right? And so what happens in practice is for most teams or analysts or whoever, they get there, a bunch of stuff is on fire because there's infections all over the place. And then they have, I don't know, 15 tools at their disposal, data feeds, you know, EDRs, seams, whatever it is, they have all this stuff. And so how do they wrangle all of this? And this will maybe blow your mind or maybe it won't, I don't know. They do it with a spreadsheet. And you might think, now, Ryan, are you being dramatic to seem funny in front of you know this group of presenters or whatever? And uh, no, I'm really not. And when I said that a lot of what this topic is gonna cover is kind of the inspiration for why we have what we call Kaleidoscope, um, even at the sort of tippy top of most organizations, they take all of this and they put it all into a spreadsheet somewhere. And then that's how they track what's going on. So some of these IRs, just to be clear, like it's not, I'm not saying these guys are doing like a bad job because like this is the industry standard, right? But some of these IRs take two weeks, three weeks, two months, you know? And so what happens is I have a bunch of stuff going wrong. I have a bunch of stuff going wrong in a bunch of different systems. And I have a bunch of tools that can maybe help with some of those systems or some of those parts. And so they need a place to basically go and do this very like segmented, okay, I look at the email. Okay, is that an infection? Okay, now I need to go look at this log. Now I need to go look at this log. Now I need to go query this tool. And they need a place to put all of that. And the, for better or worse, like the flexibility of a spreadsheet is a great place to put a bunch of like disparate data. And so you hear different terms, spreadsheet of doom, spreadsheet of death, et cetera, et cetera. Um, this one is like a CrowdStrike example. They have it on their blog post, but I will tell you, we did something similar at Mandiant. We did something similar at the NSA. Like this is just the way that things work. And it, like I said, a lot of it has to do with like the flexibility of, I need to put all the stuff that's in my brain somewhere. And so sometimes there's other tools, like they have kind of notebook specific type tooling that you can use instead of a spreadsheet but ultimately it's a basically like a big notepad where i need to put a bunch of data that comes from a bunch of different sources so if i have 15 tools open in my you know available as part of my investigation i probably have 15 tools open in my browser and then i copy one out of here and i copy one out of here and i put it on a spreadsheet and i try to like deal with it later and so the second part of like IR in reality is I've mentioned reports a couple times and I kind of said we're not really going to focus on them. But something I do want to make clear to everybody is that 
the reason that we're doing all of this, all of this investigation and the reason that we need the workflow and the reason that this whole talk exists is that everything that we're talking about with incident response is in service to a report. And that report could vary, you know, if we're talking like the Mandiant guys come in and do a two week engagement about all the ways that an organization got hacked, it's going to be a very complicated report. It's going to be something like I have on the screen here. It's going to have all these different parts to it. But if you're just an internal security team looking at a phishing email, it might not be anywhere near as long, but it's still going to cover like some of the same stuff, right? It's going to be like, what happened? That's sort of like a summary. How severe was it? That's the extent of the compromise. Um, did we fix it? How did we fix it? What should we change in the future so we're not susceptible to it again? And then supporting evidence. So that could be data from logs. That could be those IOCs I was talking about. This domain is bad. This hash is bad. That sort of stuff. We need all of this information to build a proper IR deliverable so that one, whoever we're delivering it to, whether it's our boss or a customer knows that we're not just like making stuff up and like it comes from a real place. But then ideally over time, if you look at how we've done IR reports in the past and I bring a new person on, they can look at how I've done it and they can learn something and then we can all get sort of better over time like that. And so putting this all together, right? What does IR look like right now? Something bad happens. I have a bunch of tools uh, and they do a bunch of different stuff and they all have their own interfaces and APIs and how you use them and all that stuff. I take all that information and I collect it somewhere. Maybe it's a spreadsheet. Maybe it's something a little better than a spreadsheet, but probably not. And then basically with the power of the human brain, I turn it from a spreadsheet into a report and I ship that off. Right. And maybe it's a ticket and maybe it's a report or maybe it's something else. But at the end of the day, it's a, here's my summary. Maybe it's a blog post. Right. And so this is really problem three. Remember the problems I was talking about? This is really problem three of nobody in cyber really knows what's going on because as teams grow and organizations shift and all that stuff, like you get new tools, you get new systems. This one's not patched anymore. This one falls behind. And so there's this constant like hurricane of data and for attackers, they're really good at iterating. There's always new kinds of attacks to do. There's always better ways to share, you know, exploits get published. You can go on GitHub and download a backdoor. Like they're really good at iterating. So we sort of have this like loosey goosey foundation for the defenders, but the attackers are scaling and running more and blasting more. And so we have to like figure out a better way to kind of wrangle this. And so how do we do that? What I would say and the argument that we're making is what are some kind of top level tenants that we can say that effective IR workflows should have? And I would say they should be able to handle a variety of incidents. They should be able to break down how tools are supposed to be used. And as much as they can, they should be able to track how an analyst has gone through different steps to triage an alert and say whether it's good or bad and do all that stuff. Because one thing that you guys will notice, or maybe you've already noticed, depending on you know where you've worked before, is like people don't like writing tickets. They don't like writing Jira tickets. They don't like explaining what they did. They did the work already, and they don't want to do that part. So we want to track as much of that as we can, because that's how we build better reports, and that's how we can really codify. This is the UMBC way for how we handle incidents. And so when you have new people come on board, you can just show them this is the UMBC way, connecting the incidents, and then they can kind of hit the ground running. So with that in mind, let's go and revisit some of what we've seen before and take another look at it and see if we can come up with a better kind of building block to tackle some of these problems. So here's our Fisher Price babies first fishing from earlier in the talk. And I would say the first kind of foundational piece you need to do any of this stuff in cyber is always data. And so if we could break this email apart into different pieces of data, then we can use that as sort of a blueprint for how to really define what analyzing a phishing email means and also really define what tools we have that can help us with different parts of that process. And so what is an email message? How do we break that down into kind of smaller chunks, right? Um, there's sender and receiver messages. So, you know, PCP Express went to me, that kind of stuff. Each one of those has a domain. So PCP Express has its own set of metadata because you can look up, you know, when was that domain registered? Who was it registered to? What IP address is it on? Do we know that IP is bad? That sort of stuff. Um, attachments we've talked about a couple times. You know, I need to run that through a sandbox or scan that or or whatever. And then the email content is sort of the last piece of like, does it look like a legitimate message, right? 
So I'll show you how we do this in our platform, which is if you take this phishing email and you put it into our thing, you get something that looks like this, which is a deconstructed version of what an email message like really is. So there's two hashes down at the bottom there. That's the attachment and that's the body. Then there's information about the email message itself. So who sent it, things like that. And that's all connected to this other piece of data, which is who sent the email, those domains, who received the email. So we can kind of tie targeting. And the reason that we do it, and you know, like I said, I won't really make this a product pitch, but what I will say is what this allows us to do is I can now take a look at how to use each of these components in its own unique and special way to map it to that workflow that we've been talking about the whole time. So as an example, right, I have PCP Express. If I can rip all that out of the email, then I can say, I can send pcpexpress.com to a domain reputation service, or I can look it up in a tip and I can say, is this good or bad? Similarly with the attachments, I can say, ah, here are my hashes for the content of this email, I can go look that up with my EDR. I can go look that up in a tip. I can go look that up in, you know, if you've seen virus total, right? That's kind of where all the malware goes on the internet, right? And so by really understanding what each of these pieces do, it helps me start to bring some kind of organization to what analyzing it means. Cause now it's, it's not a PCP express looks weird. It's a, PCP Express is a domain we haven't seen before, and I sent it to this service, and they said it was bad because of XYZ. So you can start to really like break out some of those pieces and use that to sort of iterating it better on over time. And then another thing that we won't really talk about here, but um, as you grow or depending on what size of security organization you work at, deconstructing the data like this um, helps organize how you pass that data to different teams, right? So if I'm the guy triaging the email message, I care about all these pieces, right? I care about the domains and I care about the content. I care about the attachments, right? But if I want to pass that off to, you know, a malware analysis team, they might only care about the hash. So you can go look at it, see if they have it, see if they're reverse engineer. And they don't care about basically any of the stuff that's up here above those two nodes. But you want to maintain sort of not quite a chain of custody, but like a chain of brain power as it goes across these different teams and different like workflows. And so um, that's why we think tokenizing this data is really powerful because what it lets us do is this is what I described the first time. And, you know, was I being a little reductive? Maybe, but not really. Right. So before I had an analyst, the email comes in, he reads it. And then here's all the stuff that we said. The content was a little off because the text was not quite right. The domain didn't really look like something we recognize. So it's probably malicious. And then there was something with the attachment extension. And so we said, that's probably weird. And so I would look at all of this and I would say, do I need to block it? Yes or no? Probably yes for that first one. And then we'd say, all right, tickets closed on to the next one. But if we really want to scale that out and we really want to be able to handle that big flood, we need to take these concepts, map it to the tools that we have, and then try to build like a more comprehensive sort of workflow around that problem. And so now that we've gone through all the stuff that we've gone through, the same email, the flow looks like this. The email comes in, we rip it apart into all these little discrete data segments. And now I have attachments that aren't, you know, they're file hashes. They have properties, they have things like that. I have the domains that come from the sender and then I have the content. And now I can decide what tools I have that can help me with just that piece of data. So I can send the attachments to the EDR. I can send the domains to a tip. And, you know, maybe we don't have some cool language, you know, reader, processor, AI thing. So maybe a human still reads the email content. But you can see I broke it down a little bit here because now what it lets me do is each of those tools are going to spit out their own kind of output, their own kind of homework, their own kind of rationale for why these things are good or bad or not. And so now it's, I take all of that, I can put that into evidence, a big block, whether that's my big report that I showed you or whether that's a comment in a ticket somewhere. And then from there, I can decide what do I want to do with that? Maybe it's a report, maybe we make a signature for it, maybe we send it to a block list, something like that. And so you can see these are generally the same steps, but I've what we've really been trying to do is get out of that kind of like pattern recognition I showed you on the first slide and break this down because now this 
is something where we understand all of the data relationships. We understand what's in an email. We understand how to use it. We understand that different parts of this email can go to different tools. So the domain goes to a tip, et cetera, et cetera. We understand that these are each discrete steps in the analysis process, even if maybe in your brain, hey, look, like I said, you know, the analysis we did on the first email is not wrong. You know, it was still right. It was still a wrong email. And so even if you could do it quickly, it's still better to have this broken out because you can't do this 7 million times a day, right? And then finally, because there's now we have these like tools involved, we can have some consistency for the types of evidence that's coming out of this process and how we put it into these IR reports. And so now let's wrap all this up and make our first kind of proper IR workflow. An email gets flagged. Could be by a user, could be by a system. We open a ticket. Then the first step is we want to grab the context to shove in that ticket. So sender, receiver, attachments, whatever IOCs we think are related to that message. Now we can go through the what we would call enrichment. Some places will also call this kind of like data pivoting, which is I have these IOCs, these like building blocks, where do I look them up in other systems? And so that's kind of what I showed you on the last slide, right? Attachments get scanned to a sandbox, uh, domains get checked against different data feeds, and maybe we check to see if uh, PCP Express has sent other team members similar messages so we can figure out if this was like a kind of one-off attack or if they're targeting the organization as a whole, right? And then we can define, okay, you've done all the analysis. Here's what I want from you. And in this case, I'm, you know, pretending to be your boss or whatever. Here's what we want in the report. It needs this data, it should cover this, it should cover when this happened, how this happened and go from there. And it should also cover, you know, whatever, signatures, whatever the organization decides they need, it's all coming from the same sort of pile of evidence, just sort of applied slightly differently. And then at the end of that, whatever the remediation steps are, you know, we notify a user, we block the email, we quarantine it or whatever. And then the last thing I'll say is there's a little step in the middle here that I sort of skip over, which is if you can break out all of these pieces, then you can start to build a bigger sort of strategy that's not just looking at the same emails over and over and over. Because you can start to ask questions of, I pulled this domain out of the email. Have we seen this before? Have we already validated that this domain is legitimate? So that's a false positive. So we let this one through. And so by really breaking down like this layer of what data is in a cyber incident and how that maps to tools that are available to your teams, um, we can start to build like a kind of knowledge management piece that says, here's all the bad stuff that's happened over the past six months. And we can use that to kind of cross-reference as new things come in. And then, like I said, the end goal is to get better sort of over time. And so the last sort of nugget that I will leave you guys with as a thought experiment or just something to think about is nothing I said here needs to be code. This is, you know, you hear people call these playbooks, you might call them workflows, et cetera, but none of this needs to be code. But if it could be code, then you really start to get into interesting problem spaces about how to scale cybersecurity analysis and how to really break down some of that information. So the way that we do this is we have workflows in our platform that go very deep into tearing apart different pieces of data. And it all is built on the same things that I've been telling you the whole time, which is any cyber incident is just a collection of like this graph representation of all these IOCs. So if we can tear that apart, we can codify what you can and can't do with those and how those map to different kinds of tools. And once you can map what they can do with different kinds of tools, then we can build these playbooks. And then if we want to go to sort of the next step of not just here's your playbook, but here's it running in like an automated capacity, then we can tie it all together with APIs because this is all, you know, it's all API driven. They're all platforms, they're all tools, it's all code. And so we want to basically go all the way down, make all these little pieces, and then we can kind of build layers on top of it. And that's really what we think is kind of the missing piece that's out there for a lot of security teams. And that's really what we're trying to get at in the problem space that we're talking about solving with these sort of incident response workflows. So um, I think I went right on time. So pretty good, but uh, I wanted to ask if anybody had any questions or thoughts or, you know, anything else about everything that I just, I just talked about, so. Okay, one question from me. Sure. So 
Do you think that this incident, incident re response workflow can be completely automated, like at least in like simple cases such as phishing game emails, or do you think there's always going to be some, uh, are there, are, there are always going to be I that are going to uh, oversight? I would say never say never. And so there might be a day when it's going to all be automated, but lots of tools, SOAR did it, AI is doing it. Lots of tools have always said, if you put this in your team, then you won't need as many people. And that has never been true. Okay. So it's a hard, what I, it's, it's really hard. And so what I would say is there's some things you can't automate, right? Like I said, like even that phishing thing, you know, there's no validation needed. Domain is weird, attachment's weird, content's weird, get it out of here, right? But you still probably want somebody to like look at it and just say, no, like I've double checked it is really legitimate. So full automation, we're probably a long way away from, but there's a lot more that could be automated. And then really the other part of this that is like a whole other talk is like, if you're a really smart cyber guy, I don't want you tearing the domain out of an email message to figure out and then sending it over. Like what I want you to do is like, here's all the stuff we know about it. And then use your brain to do what human brains are good at, which is like putting it all together and deciding yes or no. So no, I don't, I don't think for most incidents, you're ever going to get rid of your security team. No. Okay. Thank you. What are your um, plans uh, for next steps? Yeah, so for next steps, so uh, we are, you know, we're working with Jack over in Do It. You know, we're working with some of those guys, so we'll be around. Um, like I said, you know, for you, Dr. Sherman, a lot of the stuff that I talked about could be there's a lot, there's a lot out there in cyber that I think you know people could benefit from. You know, a forum like this. So there's other stuff from there, and then on the company side, you know, myself and my co-founder are both still based out of Maryland. So you know, maybe you'll see us at the job fair next year or the year after or something like that, right? So. I, I'd love to hear more about your experiences uh, creating your company. Uh, yeah, I think there's a, I mean, how much time do you have, Dr. Sherman? There's a, there's a whole, a whole lot we could we do. We don't have any space. hard stop. I mean, okay. we shouldn't carry on too long, but we have five or 10 minutes if you want to stay. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll give you guys the kind of broad strokes. And then um, I, I think what I would say is, so I, I gave everybody my background, right? And I went from government, which is very, the way they operate, you guys can probably imagine it's pretty different from the commercial space. They're very like laser focused on certain things. They have big teams, big problems, big projects, right? And so when I went out of that and I went into the FireEye, the Mandiant days, it was a pretty big kind of perspective shift because particular I don't know how, I won't aspire, I won't uh, map this to what anybody in this room believes right but I remember when I came out of school I had a sort of version in my head of what security was as kind of an industry and and how you built teams and things like that and what we kind of found at the back in the Mandiant days is like that's definitely not true at all like it, it's not to be disparaging because it's there's like a bunch of business stuff around it. But basically, you know, as an example, one of the first times I talked to one of our product guys at Mandian, I was like, oh, we could do this, this, and this. And then we have this really cool, detailed, like adversary breakdown, and it'll be awesome. And then what they told me is like, that's all cool, Ryan. But last week, we worked with a customer that spent $50,000 on this EDR and didn't turn it on. So like the problems that you think are cool and the problems that people are actually having are like way different. Right. So I think that's a perspective that you, I mean, I can tell it to you, but you guys will probably have to live it if you ever want to go down this kind of path. And then what I would say about kind of the startup space in general is you need to know why you're trying to start a company in the first place. Um, because for a lot of this, a lot of bigger teams, organizations, things like that, you know, they have innovation teams, they have our research and development, they have some of this stuff where if like what you really want is the kind of like really nitty gritty problem solving, you don't need a company to do that, right? But the flip side is 
I've always liked doing stuff like this, you know, Dr. Sherman, you know, I've given presentations at Dr. Nicholas's class. Like I've always liked like that part of it, whether that's the strict education piece of it, or just explaining like, no, here's the problem and here's how to get better. Like that kind of interpersonal piece has always been really good. And like, that's more really when you're founding a company, like that's more of like what you're growing into. And it's not like, I can't tell anybody whether or not they want to do it or they could do it or they think they should, but I think it's important to know that, you know, when you found a company, there's a lot more to it than just the product. And so to the point where like, depending on who you talk to, you know, you heard some people say the product doesn't matter at all, which I don't think is true, obviously, but um, it's definitely like a perspective shift. So I would say like in general, super rewarding, super fulfilling. And, you know, in my career, probably despite all the cool stuff I've done, you know, I was at the NSA, I was at solar winds, you know, I did all that stuff. Like the two years doing this company is more growth than all of that easily, easily combined. Um, but it's growth in like a bunch of different skill sets that, you know, are not all technical. So, um, I would just say, I would keep that in mind if you want to kind of follow the same route and, uh, more to the point, I'd probably recommend, you know, give us some time, work on, work on like real teams, work on real projects, and then kind of get the lay of the land and then decide if you want to make that jump just because it's like, you know, some people will just full send it and off they go. Right. But I think there's a lot to be said about understanding who's going to be using your products before you build a company to go and like sell products to those people, you know? Are there any more questions? Well, thank you very much, Ryan. It's very interesting. Cool. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. And then, Dr.